Worship, on this uh, rather steamy and smoky Lord's Day, that smoke uh, kind of gets to me, so uh, you might hear me clearing my throat a lot, but uh, I'm not contagious. A few announcements, uh, you see them in your bulletin there. Uh, next Sunday we'll be at Kirkabo for the 9.30 worship service, and then two weeks from today back here at Nora. And then uh, three weeks, Kirkabo service will be at their cemetery. And that, uh, in case, of course, of rain, it could happen. Worship will be back at the uh, church at usual time. So if you're going to the cemetery, if you can, bring your own chairs, it says. Otherwise, uh, any other announcements? Okay. So then let us continue with our worship service for a time of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. We confess together, righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Amen. God is, is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You're free and forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us give our attention now to the reading of God's Word. We'll read Psalm 23 responsibly. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his namesake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah prophesied before the exile in 587 BCE in this passage, he uses the metaphor of a shepherd to describe the bad kings who have scattered the flock of Israel. God promises to gather the, the flock and to raise up a new king from David's line to save Israel and Judah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and 
they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and for and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and share execute justice and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. The author of this letter reminds his audience that originally they were not part of God's chosen people. Through Jesus' death, however, they are included in God's household of faith, whose cornerstone is Jesus Christ. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles, by birth, called the uncircumcision a physical uh, circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances so that he might create in himself our new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came to proclaim peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks thanks be be to God. God. Alleluia. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. It is recorded in the Gospel according to St. Mark in the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot foot from all the crowns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about from that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to whenever they heard that he was. And wherever he he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of our Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As the old song goes, summertime and the living is easy. And part of what makes the living easy in summer is that for many people, the uh, summertime is also vacation time. Of course, vacation time is not limited to those few months in the summer. Uh, for many of us who uh, live up here near the Canadian border, uh, a winter vacation is more to be desired than summer. When the temperature hovers around zero, it feels mighty good to uh, go and spend some vacation time in a warmer climate. But whenever that urge uh, comes for a vacation, we shouldn't feel guilty for having done so. For God knows, and we should know, that times of rest are a very necessary part of our human existence. Look wrong here? Okay. <laughs> now, doctors tell us uh, that a good night's sleep is a necessary part of maintaining good bodily, mental health. When we burn the candle at both ends, as the saying goes, so that is overworking ourselves and shortchanging our normal need for sleep, the result is oftentimes a breakdown. A breakdown in our mental and also in our physical health. As it says in Psalm 127, it is in vain that you rise up early and go into to rest late, eating a bread of anxious toil. For the Lord gives sleep to his beloved. And in the 23rd Psalm, which we have before us here this morning, the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. That's an image of peace, restfulness. It's a message about a good shepherd who cares for his own by, for one thing, allowing the sheep rest. And furthermore, our spiritual health also suffers when we make work into being our God instead of worshiping the one true God. Now suddenly, certainly work and the earning of our daily bread, those are God-pleasing activities. We shouldn't neglect such activities. After all, our God is a God who works and expects those who believe in him to do likewise, if we can. Now, the Bible is a continuing record of the work that God has done, first of all, to create, then to redeem and maintain this world and all that lives upon it. But right from the beginning of the biblical record, uh, God has told people to integrate times of rest into their workaday routine. The third commandment enjoins God's people to remember, or a better translation might be observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord. In it you shall do no work. God gave that commandment, along with the other nine, uh, gave that commandment to the people of Israel, giving it to them shortly after God had freed them from their years of enslavement in the land of Egypt. For now they were free people when they heard that commandment. They were no longer to live like slaves. For you see, slaves don't have the gift of being able to take a day off each week. And in giving that commandment, uh, God himself gave us the example of how necessary that is. For you see, as we are told in the book of Genesis, after six days of creative labor at the beginning of our times, uh, on the seventh day, God took a day off. 
Now certainly an almighty God does not need to take a day of rest after six days of labor. But God did that anyway. God took a day to rest. He did that to set an example for us. God didn't need that day of rest, but God knows that we do. And through the work of Jesus Christ, God has done even that one more, one better. For God has freed us from being slaves to sin and death and the power of the devil. But also, we might add, being a slave to work. Therefore, our weekly day of rest and worship every Sunday, that's God-pleasing. It is a healthy thing also for us to be doing. When we set aside our daily work each Sunday, it's healthy for our soul as well as for our body. But it's not only good for us to have that weekly day of rest for our body and our soul, uh, besides that, some vacation time is also very good for us. Now the Bible reveals that Jesus, who is the incarnate or the in the flesh Son of God, uh, Jesus has a human body very real as ours. And because he is human, Jesus knows what it is to be tired. Tired in both the body and the soul. For several times in the Gospels, it's recorded how Jesus went off by himself uh, for times of quiet communication with his Father. And if even the Son of God needed that quiet time for prayer and medication, why should any of us mortals ever think that we are, those times are somehow optional for us? There's no substitute for taking those kind of vacations from our daily labor. Do so in order to center ourselves in the word of God. Time and again, people have uh, proven to themselves and proven to others how healthy it is to take some time every day to be with the Lord in prayer and letting the Lord speak to us through the Holy Scripture. That's a prescription for good health. Health for the mind, health for the body, and for the spirit. And even retirees like me. And then also I imagine includes quite a few of you who are sitting there this morning. We retirees also have need for that prescription in our minds. We need that daily dose of prayer, that daily dose of the Word of God. I mean, I know that my day it just doesn't seem right if I'm not able to begin and end that day with Bible reading and prayer. And that's not just something that's needful for old retired pastors like me. All of God's children certainly need to be in daily contact with our Heavenly Father. A Father who cares for us and cares for us like a good shepherd cares for the flock throughout all of their days. In our Gospel reading this morning, we're told how Jesus... Uh, sought to shepherd that original flock of his, those apostles, uh, to shepherd them into a time of vacation after those apostles had spent time, a time of strenuous labor. Now the sixth chapter of Mark that we've been dealing with uh, for quite a few weeks now uh, records how Jesus' earthly ministry was accelerating during this time. There were so many hundreds of people who needed to be healed of various physical and spiritual ailments. And there was such a, a thirst among thousands of people to hear the gospel message that he was teaching. There was just too much work for one man to accomplish, even though that one man was the Son of God. And so it says in verse 7 there of that sixth chapter of Mark, and he called to him the twelve and began to send them out two by two and give them authority over the unclean spirits. <clears throat> and it says of them a little later on in that same sixth chapter, so they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many demons 
and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And that then leads us to the opening verse of the gospel reading that I just shared with you. For it says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. They had worked hard. And their labors had been rewarded. Rewarded with success. And Jesus knew then that it's now time to give those hard-working apostles some well-deserved rest. For he says, come away by yourselves and rest a while. It was time to take a little vacation. But Mark adds a, a bit of uh, explanation, uh, which sometimes uh, our own breakneck pace of living uh, would do well to heed. It says, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. But as we continue reading in today's gospel, we see that that vacation wasn't to be. Yes, Jesus knew that times of rest are needed by those who have worked hard, but the needs of others, that also, that they also need to be considered. So as it sometimes happens to people today, uh, when Jesus and his apostles went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves, Jesus' work arrived at that so-called deserted place before he and the apostles did. And in this age of smartphones, the internet, many find that it's increasingly difficult to leave one's daily work behind. And sometimes, for the good of others, it's best that we must sacrifice our time of rest in order to serve other people. And so because he had uh, compassion for them, as we're told here, Jesus placed a high priority on teaching a higher priority than he had on taking a much-deserved vacation with his apostles. And furthermore, Jesus' compassion for those thousands of people I didn't stop with just feeding their spirits with the word of God. You may notice that there's a gap in many verses right in the middle of our gospel reading. Verses 35 through 52 are not included in this Sunday's reading because that's the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. That will be considered next Sunday. We'll deal with that message which tells how Jesus in a miraculous way fed those thousands who were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus ministered to their whole being, feeding their minds, feeding their spirits, Yes, feeding their bodies, just as he seeks to do for people today. And by, by so doing, our Lord set the example for what the church, which is the body of Christ, what we're to be doing at all times. Yes, our Lord knows what it is uh, that we who follow his, uh, his lead, we do, do need times of rest and relaxation, just like he did. But there are other priorities that should be considered beyond our need to rest for a while. A loving Savior did not tell the hurting and anger, hungry people there to go away. I'm on vacation. And by his example, he teaches us that we must always consider the needs of others as well as our own needs. Then there must always then be a balance in the life of the faithful Christian. The balance between self-care and the care we have for others. And both are important. For if we burn ourselves out by neglecting to care for ourselves physically and mentally, uh, spiritually, we, we won't be very effective in our efforts to care for others. Like the advice that is given by the flight attendants, passengers about to depart on an airline. The attendant will instruct those passengers that if they're, they're traveling with young children and an emergency causes those oxygen masks to fall from the overhead, uh, it's necessary that we put on our own mask first. Then when our own mask is in place and we're 
getting the needed oxygen, then place the mask on the child or on anybody else who might need assistance. The logic behind that seemingly selfish command is that if you black out for lack of oxygen, you won't be able to help anybody else either. And that's the same logic that lies behind that third commandment. And all of the other commandments in God's word concerning the necessity of taking care of ourselves. It's good for us, as it says, to come away to an exerted place all by ourselves and rest a while. But we must also keep in mind that we do so in order to better equip ourselves to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. The Good Shepherd. Amen. Our hymn of the day, Savior, like a shepherd lead us. During the singing of that, the offering will be received. Join in confessing our basic beliefs as Christians using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. As we are one, in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, let us now join our voices in prayer. We pray for the Church of Jesus Christ in this and in every land. Through the one who is the cornerstone of a firm foundation, join us together and build us up as a temple of mercy and peace. 
in your mercy. We pray for the creation. Cause new trees to be planted. Restrain the melting of polar ice caps. Save your land from destruction. Like a shepherd leading his sheep, raise up from among us caretakers for all that you have made. In your mercy, and we pray for the leaders of nations and the heads of tribes. Where peace seems to be far off, bring it near. Where justice seems fleeting, bring it to light. Where discord seems relentless, bring harmony. In your mercy, we pray for the health and well-being of family, friends, and neighbors. Heal those who are sick, especially Sonia and Roger, Veronica, Dan, Whitney, Chris, Lee, Terry, Brent and Linda, and all others who we name and now in our hearts before thee. And we also pray for those who are grieving the death of one whom they love, we commend to your comforting care the families and friends of Ron Olson, or Oren, and Terry Burquist. Give courage to all who struggle with addiction. Touch with your tender care all who reach out to you in pain. In your mercy, we pray for this parish of your church and for the faith communities that are represented this week at the ELCA Youth Gathering. Nurture the faith of young people as they encounter new experiences and new people. Break down dividing walls and inspire collaboration among people of every age. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and for all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. At Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined as one. Come and see. Please be seated. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. May the blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, may that blessing be upon you, now and forever. Amen. Our sending him, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing.